welcome to today's session on Research Basics. My name is Beth, and I'm glad to have you here today. I'm from the Student Academic Success Team here at Ambrose University, and when it comes to research skills, we're one of your key resources. In particular, our Writing Centre can help to support you as you work through a research project. But there's another important resource, the library. If you're in the library, you might see our library staff reshelving books, answering questions at the circulation desk, or helping students access our ebook collections. But they do so much more than that. At Ambrose, our library staff are expert researchers, and they're always glad to help students with their research projects. Today, I'm delighted to have one of our library staff, Patty Neufeld, here to talk to, about research with me. I'll be starting off our session today, and then partway through, I'll turn it over to Patty. If you are attending live, we invite you to sign in to your YouTube account and say hi in the live chat. You can use this space to engage with us and with each other during the session. Patty and I will keep an eye on the chat throughout so that we can respond to your comments and your questions. Now I want to start us off today with a little scenario. Let's say I have a friend who loves sharing weird facts, and one day my friend makes this statement, frogs always blink when they swallow. In fact, my friend, my friend says, frogs can't even swallow with their eyes open because they use the blinking motion to help push the food into their stomachs. Now that's an interesting claim. Frogs always blink when they swallow. Now I don't know much about frogs, but I trust my friend, so I believe her statement. In fact, I decide, hmm, I go around telling other people too. Now let's imagine two alternatives. In both cases, I believe wholeheartedly that the statement is true. But in the first case, it turns out to be false. Is that knowledge? Not really, that's false belief. Let's imagine a second case. Again, I believe my friend's statement wholeheartedly. I'm not a biologist or anything, so I don't know much about frogs. But just by luck, I happen to be right. Is my statement knowledge, or is it still just a belief? Really, it's just a belief. Uh, true belief, but it's still a belief. This is an interesting and an important point. I can believe something, and it can be true, but that alone doesn't constitute knowledge. If I have, want to have genuine knowledge, what else do I need? Not just belief. It can't just happen to be true. What else do I need? If you're joining us live, you can share your answer in the live chat. It's a silly example, so all answers are welcome. Now, while you're thinking, I want to introduce you to what we're going to cover today. We're going to start with some foundational questions. First of all, why do we research? What kinds of research can we do and how can we use it? In other words, what are the types of research and how do we use our research? Um, we're also going to talk about how we research. Uh, research is a complex task involving more steps and skills than we can possibly cover today. In this session, we want to give you an overview of the topic, a kind of an orientation to research. Then, when you're ready for more, we recommend that you check out our upcoming deep dive workshops on research. In those sessions, we'll have the time and space to break down the process in more detail with lots of practical examples. So we'd encourage you to check those out. You can find out more about those sessions at ambrose.edu slash workshops. Now, as we said, we want to start out with the reasons to research, the why question. Now, there's an obvious answer to this question. We research because we have to, because our profs require it. But there's a deeper and more important answer. So let's return to our opening scenario with the frog. How important, or how is knowledge different than belief that just happens to be true? Um, we can check in with the live chat. Um, the key thing, not seeing any comments immediately, but the key thing is that knowledge must be justified by evidence. In philosophical terms, knowledge is justified true belief. So we already had the true belief parts, but now we have the justified. We have to have evidence to justify our beliefs. Now how do we get that evidence? Research. If we want to know stuff, genuinely know stuff, we need to do research. Research can help us develop an accurate, full understanding of our topic. Now, knowing stuff is good, but it's even better if we can share our knowledge with others, with friends, colleagues, 
experts, even the public, um, here to research helps us. When others know that we've done our research, they know that they can trust us and trust the information that we're trying to share. So when we research, let's remember why we're doing it. It's not just to check a box on our prof's assignment rubric. It's actually because we're trying to develop our knowledge of the subject and then have the authority to share that knowledge with others. That's really what research is about. Now, there are different types and levels of research. Believe it or not, we actually do research every day. So let's say I want to buy a new blender. I, I've heard that good blenders are hard to find. Um, some of them are kind of wimpy and they can't handle anything firmer than a smoothie. Um, and some of them are like really expensive long-term investments. Um, so they vary widely in quality and in cost. Now, because they're not all equal, I'm probably not going to buy the very first one I see. I'm going to do some research first. Now, let's imagine that I'm running a business and I'm considering a major deal with a partner. Again, I'm probably going to do some research before I sign that deal. Am I going to do equal levels of research in both cases? Am I going to do the same types of research in both cases? Probably not. The amount and type of research I do will depend on the decision. How much information do I need? How much does it matter if I'm wrong? One of the first things we need to figure out when we're doing research is what type of research is appropriate. For simple, low stakes decisions like my blender, we often use sources that are meant for general interest. Sources like Wikipedia or the reviews on Amazon. But in the academic context, we're usually interested in big ideas, often with important consequences. We often need a whole lot of information before we can form an educated idea and often, in the academic context, the stakes are pretty high. So when we do academic research, we're not just looking for blogs or product reviews. We're looking for scholarly sources. Now, don't get me wrong. General interest sources can still be useful for academic work in that they can get us thinking about the broad strokes of an issue. But they can't give us the depth and accuracy that we want for this level of knowledge, for academic accuracy. We need to go deeper. Um, I want to pause and take a moment to welcome those who are joining us live. Um, welcome to our team today. Uh, glad to see you here. Um, now, when we're thinking about the types of research we can do, um, we also need to distinguish between different types of sources. Um, and you might have heard the term primary, secondary, and tertiary. These are all ways that we collect evidence about a subject. Now, in primary research, you're collecting evidence through experiment or observation. You're actually doing something or observing something directly. In disciplines like sociology and biology, psychology, primary research is usually experimental. You design a survey or a study, you do it, and then you record your results. In disciplines like literary studies, biblical studies, history, philosophy, a lot of the humanities, primary research is actually a form of observation. You're examining a historical artifact or a biblical text or a philosophical idea or a work of art, and you're making your own observations about it. Again, you're collecting evidence about your subject directly. In secondary research, though, you're collecting evidence indirectly by learning about what someone else has done or what someone else has observed. Instead of me designing and running a study, I'm reading about somebody else's study. Instead of looking at the historical artifact myself, I'm reading about what somebody says about that historical artifact. In each case, I'm drawing my information from a source, um, which we can classify as primary or secondary. Primary sources are the materials that I'm using to draw direct conclusions when I'm doing the experiment or making the observation directly. Now, if you're working in the social sciences or in the sciences, um, these primary materials might be sets of numbers. They might be the results of your survey, the measurements you made at the end of an experiment, something like that. If you're in the humanities, and sometimes the social sciences as well, the primary sources will very often be texts or objects the Bible, a novel, a set of interviews, an artwork, or an artifact. 
Either way, primary research material isn't filtered by somebody else. You're analyzing the original thing, not an interpretation of it. Secondary sources are always reports of what others think about the primary sources. So they usually come in written or oral form in the shape of books, articles, lectures, presentations, things where a researcher is discussing his or her ideas about the topic. Here, again, it's a secondary source, so you're learning about the topic indirectly rather than studying it yourself. Now, there is one more layer of complexity here. Let's say that I'm researching the history of commercial food production, and I read an encyclopedia entry on how World War II influenced the industry. The article summarizes three different views on the subject and names key researchers associated with each view. Is this, the encyclopedia article, a secondary source? Not really. In this case, we actually have three different types or layers of sources. There's the actual sources themselves, the historical documents themselves, and you'll see that on the screen down at the bottom. If we wanted to do our own primary research, we'd need to look directly at these sources, like maybe factory reports or something from the time period. Then, above that, there are the studies that the three key researchers in the article have done on the topic. And those are probably published in books or journal articles. If we read these books and journal articles, we're doing secondary research. But at the very top, we have the encyclopedia entry, and that's summarizing those secondary sources. That's what we call a tertiary source. A tertiary source is a review or a summary of what a bunch of secondary sources have said about the topic. So we've got those three layers, each commenting on the other, each with a different layer of filtering. All three types of sources have their own merit. Primary sources help you form your own opinions and help you contribute new things to the field because you're making new observations or doing new experiments. Secondary sources help you see what other people have already found and then build on that knowledge. Tertiary sources help you to organize the knowledge in a given field. They can give you a sense of the outlines of the topic and the major researchers in it. They can also help you to evaluate the field by identifying gaps in knowledge or areas of agreement or disagreement between different researchers. Some university assignments will ask you to focus on one type of research or another. In a lab report, for example, you might refer to the findings of others, secondary sources, but you'll probably focus on what you observed yourself, your own measurements, your own statistics, those kinds of things. In a literature review, by contrast, you're not doing any of your own research. You're simply reviewing the work of others. So you'll be working exclusively with secondary and tertiary sources. Some assignments will ask you to do both. For example, in a paper about the Bible, you'll probably need to make your own observations about what the Bible says, using it as a primary source, but you'll probably also wanna back up your ideas by referring to what others have said about the Bible. So you'll be using the Bible as a primary source, directly analyzing it, but you'll also be using secondary and tertiary sources when you're drawing on the work of others. So, depending on the assignment, you might find yourself using different types of sources for different purposes. Now, speaking of different purposes, let's talk about how you can use the sources that you find. And I will say, if you are joining us live, feel free to chime in at any point with questions or comments, and we'll address those as we go. Um, let's talk now about those different purposes, and let's imagine that you're writing a paper for an art history class. You've chosen to write on a, a well-known painting called The West Wind by Canadian artist Tom Thompson. This is one of those assignments where you're probably going to do both direct research, your own primary investigation of the painting, and secondary research, where you're reading other people's analyses of the painting. Let's say you've done both of those types of research and you've settled on a thesis. Tom Thompson's The West Wind presents nature as lonely and hostile. Now, in your secondary research, when you're reading other people's articles and books, you found three texts, three articles. Article one says that Thompson often uses themes of isolation in his work. Article two 
points out one painting where Thompson represents nature as lively, friendly, and inviting. And then Article 3 says the main theme of the painting, The West Wind, is actually the beauty and the warmth of nature. Which of these sources would you use in your paper? Think about your answer for a second, and if you're joining us live, you can type it into the text chat. Um, you can just type in one, two, or three, or you can type in some combination of those things. So take a moment, and we'd love to hear from you in the text chat. Now, as you're thinking, let's take a look at each one in turn. The first one seems pretty clear. You can use it to provide direct support for your claim. This is a nice little snippet. You could take a little quotation or a little paraphrase to put into your introduction to give your argument some authority right from the outset. So if you're typing in a one in the text chat, absolutely. Um, this is a source that you would probably want to use. How about articles two and three? Many students would say that these articles are irrelevant to their work and just discard them. What do you think? Now, I actually think that it would be a mistake to, discor to discard articles two and three. Now, don't worry if you type two or three. Um, if you've never thought to use sources like these ones, you're not alone. It's a common way of thinking. Um, but learning how to use sources like these can help you set your work apart. Think about it. How could you use number two? Well, you could use it to qualify your position. You still think your point is accurate, but you probably should acknowledge that your point might not apply to every single painting by Tom Thompson. People change their minds, so maybe artists do too. So yeah, perhaps nature is lonely and rugged in this painting, maybe it's not in one of his other paintings. So you could use number two as kind of a qualifier for your argument. How about number three? Well, you could use it to point out an opposing view and then argue against that view. When we're using evidence from secondary and tertiary sources, we need to be careful that we're not just ignoring contrary evidence. Instead, we want to present the critic's idea and then argue against it. That's actually not a weakness. As any philosopher will tell you, it's much better to identify objections to our arguments ourselves rather than waiting for somebody else to do that for us. If I point out the objection myself, it means I have an opportunity to respond to that objection. So, which of those three sources should you use? All of them. How, how can you use them? This, these bring up three different ways that we can use sources to support our argument. First of all, there's the straightforward way to just use a source that directly agrees with your argument. The second way is you use the source to qualify your argument, to provide some sort of like, well, it, it applies in this case, not in that case. And then the third is to argue against any possible objections to your argument. All three uses show that you're engaged in the academic conversation around the issue and they help you to create and share knowledge about the subject. Now, research is only one part of the larger writing process. The writing process as a whole has seven major steps. First, understanding the assignment. Second, generating ideas. Third, narrow your focus. Fourth, gathering evidence. Fifth, organizing your ideas. Sixth, drafting, and seventh, editing and revising. Now, I should say, this process isn't exactly a linear one. Often we start the process and then we loop back to a previous step. But this outline gives us a general idea of what it looks like. Research, too, is a cyclical process, not a linear one. So research can actually happen at multiple stages in the writing process. That said, most of your research will come in the middle section of the process, in steps two to four. So I want to break down those steps a little bit. Step two is where you start generating ideas for your assignment. At this stage, you'll likely want to do two things. First, you'll want to brainstorm your own ideas about the topic. And then second, you'll want to discover other people's ideas about the topic. So this too is a cyclical process. 
but I would recommend that you always start with at least a few ideas of your own before looking around to see other people's ideas. That way you'll have a clearer direction when you do start to look at other people's ideas. Also, you'll be less likely to be overwhelmed by all the ideas out there and lose track of your own thoughts. So you can always change your mind later, but it is best to start with a few of your own ideas. Once you've done that, you'll enter step three where you'll narrow your focus. You might refine the question you're trying to answer and you'll likely develop a hypothesis or a working thesis. Once you have that guiding idea, you can begin collecting evidence. The way that you do that will differ depending on the assignment. So for example, remember how we talked about primary and secondary research? If your assignment is asking you to focus on primary research, most of your evidence will come from primary sources. The measurements or statistics you've collected from doing a study or the texts and objects you're analyzing. If you're analyzing a novel, you might need to, at this stage, read through the novel again and collect up all the material that's relevant to your topic. If you're analyzing survey results, this is the point where you might need to run a series of statistical tests to collect the results. If your assignment is asking you to focus on secondary and tertiary research, like in a review paper, you'll want to gather secondary sources, like books and articles, and read through them looking for relevant evidence. And if your assignment requires you to do both, you'll want to do both then. You'll need to analyze the numbers and texts or objects that you're working with at the primary source level, but you'll also need to integrate the ideas of other researchers. Again, if you need to do both, it's best to start with the primary, with your own ideas, because by formulating your own ideas first, you'll form a clearer sense of where you should look for secondary sources. And you're, again, more, less likely to lose track of your own ideas as other people's ideas flood in. Once you've gathered all of this evidence, you need to carry on to steps five and five through seven. So you need to organize your ideas, draft the paper, and then revise and edit. You might need to do more research during this process, especially as you discover any gaps in your research as you go. Again, it's a cyclical process uh, with loops back throughout, but the majority of your research will probably occur in the middle, in stages two to four. Now at this point, I wanna turn our time over to Patty, who will talk a little bit about what these steps might look like for you. Hi, I'm Patty Neufeld, and I'm one of the librarians here at Ambrose University. For the remainder of our time today, we want to talk about strategies that you can use to guide you through this process that Beth has been talking about. We won't be able to go into much depth just because there's so much to say, but we hope that some quick tips will help. For more information about any of these things, you can always check out one of our deep dive workshops or just come to the library or the Academic Student Success Center um, for additional help. So we're now going to spend a little time doing some practical application of the research process. And in particular, I will demonstrate how the three interconnected ideas, gener or three interconnected steps rather, generating ideas, narrowing your focus, and gathering evidence, what these three steps might actually look like in real life. When it comes to generating ideas, I recommend creating a concept map where you can jot down keywords and phrases as you brainstorm your ideas and look at other researchers' ideas. A concept map can be a quick and dirty list of words and phrases, or it can be structured to visually show the relationships between words and phrases. You can even add colors and symbols. It is like a living representation of your research process and a tool to help you engage with your topic, become more knowledgeable about the subject matter, and hunt for sources. You can start your concept map by brainstorming ideas based on what you already know. Good places to go next for researching other people's ideas are general sources like your course textbook, encyclopedias, subject overviews, 
and even Wikipedia. Keep in mind that you'll want to edit your concept map as you work through the research process, and you may even wish to map your sources. It can get a little messy at times, and that's okay. Narrowing your focus is something that happens as you begin to understand the potential and the limitations of your topic of interest. In your preliminary reading and search for sources that relate to your topic, you'll start to get a sense of what angles other researchers have already explored, various theories and opinions about the topic, who the key scholars are, and areas that are open for further research. You'll need to sift through the ideas and the sources that you encounter so that you can continue refining your concept map and your searching process. Start to focus on the angles that appeal, appeal to you and which appear to be supported by sufficient evidence and material. You'll also want to pay close attention to the quality of the sources that you are engaging with and their availability. At this point, you'll need to move past the general sources and start looking for materials which are most relevant and specific to the research question or the angle that you are exploring. So these could include sources like journal articles and book chapters or essays and possibly primary materials. Spend some time browsing the library's online catalog and relevant databases. Read abstracts, summaries, and book flaps. The process will actually look something like this. And by now, you probably have a pretty good sense of how interconnected these so-called steps are and how the process is much more cyclical and back and forth than it is linear. Gathering evidence and sources is something that you actually do from the beginning, casting a very wide net at first, and then as you move through the course of the research process and work to fulfill the expectations of your research assignment, you'll become more discerning in your search and your selection process, and you may actually end up weeding out sources. It probably goes without saying that in addition to evaluating the relevance and the quality of your sources, you'll also need to implement a system to track and to organize them. You can keep a list of sources with annotations, or you can tie them to the ideas in your concept map. Now I'm going to demonstrate how you can put these steps into action. Let's say I'm taking a course on the history of 20th century music. I'm intrigued by the connection between impressionist artists and composers in early 20th century France. I create a quick and dirty concept map, just using the terms that I'm familiar with. The textbook for the course is Mark Evan Bond's A History of Music in Western Culture. So I first go to the chapter in my course textbook titled The Search for New Sounds, 1890 to 1945. And I reread the section in there about Impressionism. The textbook author mentions that the association between Impressionist art and early 20th century French music is actually somewhat controversial. Impressionism was also not a well-liked term by the artists and the musicians to whom the term was applied at the time. So I go back to my concept map and I make a few adjustments because I might like to explore the actual validity of the association between music and the term Impressionism. So now I go to the back of my textbook and I look to see if there's a bibliography. And in fact, there is. And I find reference to a promising overview of 20th century music called Soundings by Glenn Watkins. I look this up in the Ambrose Library online catalog and I see that it is available. So I submit a request to have it put on hold for me to pick up. When I look at the table of contents for the book, 
And here's the book Soundings by Glenn Watkins. I noticed that it has an entire chapter devoted to the works of composer Claude Debussy and the concepts of Impressionism and symbolism in his music. Now, I already know that Debussy is one of the primary composers to whom the term Impressionism is applied. So this is perfect. There's also a short bibliography of related readings at the end of the chapter, as well as a list of music compositions by Debussy and some of his contemporaries. So these will actually qualify as primary sources. So when I've been searching the catalog, I noticed that there is actually a virtual browse feature in the record of you know, each book title that I look up. So I take some time scrolling through this and I find some more general 20th century music overviews that may be worth looking at. I email these titles to myself from within the catalog in case I want to check them out later. Now, I also know that my professor has mentioned that the library has a music encyclopedia that is a really good place to start doing music research. So I'm guessing that there may be an entry in the encyclopedia about Impressionism. So I consult with a librarian who confirms that this is so and is able to send me an electronic scan of the article. In reading the article, I start to broaden my understanding of Impressionism, and I also find an extensive bibliography at the end. Many of the sources are in French, so that's too bad, but I focus on the English ones. And there's a great looking citation for a book called Music and Painting by Edward Locke Spizer. I discover, sadly, that it's not in the Ambrose Library collection. However, my research paper is due at the end of term, so I have lots of time to collect sources. I submit an interlibrary loan request to see if Ambrose can source the book from another library. In the bibliography for the encyclopedia article, I also find reference to a journal article titled Musical Impressionism, the Early History of the Term. I look up the journal title in the library catalog to see if Ambrose has access to it, and I find out that it is available in one of our databases. So I'm able to actually print it off. And the article looks at the historical use of the term as applied to music, and I've been thinking about formulating my research question around this idea. So now I need to spend a little time reading and sifting everything that I have so far to see what I can glean and how I might further refine my topic and direct my research. So now my concept map looks something like this. So at this point, I decide it's time to start looking at more focused sources. So I consult some journal databases for scholarly articles. I use the keywords and phrases from my, from my refined concept map to search the databases, but I'm not sure that I'm using the best search techniques, so I visit the library to get some expert help. As I examine the lists of results that I'm getting and I experiment with searching, I discover some useful keywords that I hadn't thought of before, as well as some subject headings that are directly relevant to my topic and the direction that I want to go in. I continue to edit my concept map and my search strategy. I also spend a little bit of time looking for relevant music recordings and scores. Remember that these will be my primary sources, and the assignment asks that we focus um, to some extent on actual music composition. By now, I have a pretty good list of general and reference sources, relevant music compositions and scores, and focused journal articles. And after taking some time to digest the materials that I've collected so far, I'm ready to formulate my research question. To get help with this, I reach out to my professor and to the student academic success team. 
I know that I'm going to continue the process of hunting and gathering, but I feel pretty confident that I followed a good process and I've taken care to track and organize all my sources along the way. So I'm on my way. So now we just want to wrap up. If you have any questions or comments about the things we've discussed today, please take a moment to write them in the live chat. While you're thinking about this, let's look back at what we've covered today. We've gone over some practical stuff, like what sort of sources should you be looking for? How can you gather and organize your sources? What are the key steps? What tools can you use to help you? To learn more about all of these practical skills, we encourage you to check out our upcoming deep dive workshops where you'll have a chance to see practical examples of how all the research, how all of the research process looks like in action. And in our next two YouTube live sessions, you'll learn more about how to acknowledge your sources accurately through good citation practices. All of this stuff, the what and the how of research is important because of the why. Whether in our personal lives, in our studies, in our careers, good research matters because it helps us build reliable foundations for our decisions. When we research well, we can be confident in what we know and others can be confident in us too. So I'm just gonna have a, a quick look for questions. No, no questions today. Uh, if you have further questions that you think of down the line, please don't hesitate to email us at studentsuccess at ambrose.edu or library at ambrose.edu. We look forward to helping you make your next research project a success. Bye for now.